Welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, so my name is Greg Harris. I'm an applications analyst in the Office of Institutional Research and Assessment. And I've been with Carolina um, almost two years. And, and that long experience. Mm -hmm. Robert X and his boss, uh, director of export reporting and institutional research, been here about four years in, in February, going for another set of ice storms. We'll all go to get a shinjo and have to explain the vacation. Yeah. I first got here the first week I was here was ice storm. I got here work three days. What was that work three days? And then the, the third day we left early and we didn't come back for a week. And I thought, what a good job. I came I came to the came to the south to, to find good weather and I get this. Three for a week. Three for a week. Mm-hmm. And so they changed the policies I came. <laughs> Um, so before we get started, we do want to recognize and acknowledge our colleagues um, who made some invaluable contributions, not only to the dashboard that we're going to talk about at the end, um, but also their contributions to this presentation. A lot of, particularly what I'm going to talk about in the first half is a direct reflection of their really world-class um, teaching and scholarship. So um, we thank them very much. Um, so we'll start with a brief introduction to the Student Success Initiative at Chapel Hill, and then we'll take some time to talk about one of the components of that, which is advancing inclusive excellence and what that means. Um, and then um, Rob will pick up and we'll move um, to talk about the development of um, the MCAD project and how we've been piloting it and provisioning it. Um, and then at the end, we'll take a look at the actual tool itself. <clears throat> so because we're an office of institutional research and assessment, anytime you witness the presentation delivered by an IR person. There's a slide something like this. Um, so I can just quickly give you some highlights and stats about our fall 2018 student body. Um, we had record setting enrollment at um, over 30,000 students. This fall, 58% identified as female, 28% identified with at least one underrepresented under minority category 40 percent of all students were receiving some kind of need-based financial aid um, and of our undergraduate students 19 percent um, which is kind of staggering um, identified as a first time in college student and their family a first generation student and for those undergraduate students the university-wide uh, student success initiative is thrive at carolina and there's two objectives of Thrive. One is the enhancement of coordinated student support services. And uh, two is the elimination of disparities in retention and graduation rates among students with different backgrounds. The guiding principle of Thrive is that UNC Chapel Hill believes all admitted students can thrive in college, graduate, and grow into lifelong learners. Thrive also defines the university's vision of student success as well as an environment in which student success is likely. So you note that this includes appreciating diverse perspectives as well as developing one, one's own identity in an environment that affirms cultural identities and advances inclusive excellence. And it's this partic these particular components of Thrive um, that really led to the foundation um, of the creation for the dashboard that we're going to talk about in a few moments. Um, but first, I'll take a couple of moments to talk about um, what does an inclusive, inclusive classroom mean? Um, I certainly didn't know what that meant when we got into this project. Um, so I can take a few minutes to talk about that. Teaching inclusively requires instructors to reflect intentionally on the decisions that they make about their courses um, by answering two questions. One, who's not being heard in the class, and two, who's being left behind in the class. An inclusive classroom is one which recognizes that the diversity among students is not what causes disparities. <clears throat> Instead, it's the lack of structure in course design and classroom environment, which hurts students unequally. So an inclusive classroom, as I mentioned, has two structure components, course design and classroom environment. Structured course design uh, addresses disparities that can happen outside of the classroom, and it addresses the question, who's being left behind? Structured classroom environments uh, can address disparities that happen inside the classroom, and it addresses the question, who's not being heard? And so from our faculty sponsors, we learned some of what's actually going on in the classroom. Um, and some of us, um, such as Rob and myself, and I think maybe others, 
in the audience today um, where we're not involved so much in the classroom. We thought it would be interesting to share some of what's actually happening in the classroom by our faculty um, to address issues like student success. So I thought we could share some of what they're doing. So for example, um, to increase the structure of your course design, in incorporating frequent low stakes assessments help students practice for high stakes assessments. So exam for example, having many lower stakes quizzes instead of just a few high, high stakes tests gives students more opportunities to be successful. Exactly, thank you. The <clears throat> requiring practice before, during, and after class keeps students continuously engaged with the course material, and having a variety of learning activities accommodates students with different learning styles. And finally, a syllabus with explicit dates and deadlines and specific goals and objectives helps set clear expectations and alleviate anxieties about course requirements. <clears throat> and so some more examples of what they're doing to increase, increase the structure of their classroom environment. One is, an as an example, is allowing for anonymous participation. So using technology to collect feedback helps build confidence among students that they actually belong with their peers using small groups. Some students feel more comfortable interacting with a small group rather than a full class discussion. Um, they can foster a sense of community among the students by having them share something about themselves in order to assign a group reporter. So for example, the group reporter could be the student with the hometown furthest away from campus. And it may seem obvious, but uh, lastly, Instructors should explicitly promote access and equity. This could be done verbally on the first day of class um, or in a diversity statement on the syllabus. A simply, uh, excuse me, a student simply hearing you belong here can make a huge impact. So speaking of that impact, once our instructors have actually implemented these techniques in the design of their courses and in their classroom environments, it naturally leads to the question, well, how can I measure the impact this has had on student performance? And so this question leads to more questions and to more questions. And all of these are really good questions that deserve consideration and institutional support. And that institutional support is the practice to which we aspire in the field of institutional research. In particular, we work to activate a student-focused para student paradigm centered around student success. Um, where faculty have access to data that informs their decision making and the decision making that they have in their courses and their classrooms. Which is the glue uh, that uh, brings us uh, to my course analytics dashboard. It turns out that, uh, it turns out that, uh, that a report isn't good enough to answer the questions that they want. We'd be cranking out reports every five seconds for faculty members to, to address this question. So uh, it became apparent that a dashboard solution was the answer. But a dashboard of, of uh, this type is, is touching on sensitive data. And we'll talk about which data points in a minute. It's uh, dealing with the entire campus uh, from, the, from the instructional side. Administratively, uh, we, we, had it, we dealt with um, a number of the uh, in the report. Data stewards oh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, to make sure that they were okay with how the information is being shared. And, being. and so this list of, of, of people all came together and, and set some uh, some of the parameters on the uh, the uh, dashboard. So they need to define this dashboard. Why exactly? What is exactly is it for? We don't have a purpose ourselves. So even starting on it. Uh, kind of identifying the regulatory and data governance areas of this dashboard. What what? Do we have to be worried about there's uh, the legal people around here? I don't think, but, mm -mm, but they were, yeah, but, uh, university uh, attorney was involved. University, university council was involved. With this what, what are the regulations that registrar are involved? What, is, what, are we dealing with, what are we dealing with here? Identifying what tools do we have available and what's the appropriate tool for this project? And then um, obviously, we've got a tool, we've got a purpose. What, what content do we have in, mm -hmm. want to have in there? And then how does that content? Turn into functionality. How are people interact with that content? As I said, a report isn't enough because of the, the complexity of the questions that are being asked. 
So we want in, uh, the, in the end, the instructor is uh, to, to be able to slice and dice and, and visit and revisit often. Doesn't mean they will, but we want them to. So uh, our dashboard come together with, with a purpose. We want to give them the data exploration and discovery to the faculty members. SAS Visual Analytics right now is the enterprise uh, dashboard. Uh, as you know, our campus is highly, um, somewhere before here, um, decentralized. Yes. Uh, with a number of very willful IT people willing to, uh, and with some money behind them, willing to buy other tools. And so uh, Tableau has is, is taken on some, some roles in some, some of the schools and we've done there. This is the enterprise tool at the moment. Uh, when we started two and a half years ago, two years ago. Uh, for level of security, we needed to make sure that the instructors could see only their own sections. And we had, with that, we had to focus on the primary instructor of the class because the instructor is often recorded in funny ways. There's some limitations. We were looking initially at undergraduate level courses only for fall and spring terms with standard letter grade uh, mode in part to make sure that there were at least 10 grades assigned. But make sure we get down so far they're going to say, hey, that's Joey. Mm -hmm. Turns out that they're going to be able to identify Jane, Joey, or anybody in between uh, if they do enough slicing. Uh, but this is but the these were the guidelines outlined the guidelines by the committee. For reasonable protection of the privacy. Part of the requirements, we need to look, look at this over time. So uh, recently, in fact, uh, one of our contributors, um, Kelly Hogan, uh, introduced the Flip classroom. Mm -hmm. I think she was one of the pioneers of flipped classrooms here, uh, where the students, instead of coming to classroom receiving lecture, they have read the material before class. They come to classroom have exercise and application. So uh, uh, Kelly can now look at her, her grade distribution before she did that, and then look at it after. Did it make a difference? Did it impact different people differently? And we'll talk about that a little bit. We all can look at past terms. Uh, we ask people how people ask us and go to the uh, to avoid implicit bias, we don't want people to look at their, their, their students and have the, the empirical knowledge of the, of the distributions of grade and gender uh, of any of that. So, my students are in the soccer, they do really well. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly, it'll be become a self fulfilling prophecy. The uh, information that we needed to put in here was the grades by themselves, the grade distributions, the student demographics by themselves, and then the intersection at each demographic point. So these are the demographics that we've uh, <coughs> decided that they were, we were told to give initially. Now, in uh, the federal reporting world, race ethnicity uh, pushes all um, non-resident aliens into the category, regardless of the race category. For internal reporting purposes, we split we put them into the race ethnic category that they uh, identify, identify with to help them help with the services that we provide for various categories. Mm -hmm. um, so then we split that into residency, so you're in-state, out-of-state, or international in residency rather than in race. First, uh, first uh, year for transfer, admit type, and we talk about Elgin, fellow first generation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so I can talk a little bit more of the technical, um, the back end of the dashboard. Um, so the first step begins with the base SAS program, which extracts the final course grades and the student demographic information um, from fall 2010 to the most recently closed term um, from PeopleSoft. And the second step of that program is to truncate and reload that data into the, the Oracle database that we have in uh, institutional research. The second step, we then have reporting views um, off of those tables that add descriptive and derived data elements such as course catalog information and other things related to the section. Because we populate all course grades in all sections in our database, the view also has limiting logic built into it um, to limit the sections down to um, the MCAD requirements that Rob just described. Then third, we have a SAS data integration studio job that unloads the, da the data from SAS laser server and then reloads it back up to SAS data <coughs> SAS laser server from the reporting views in our Oracle database. And so once the data are loaded to laser, then we've created a, a dashboard in SAS Visual Analytics to present the data. And that dashboard is accessed by end users via Infoport. We get to have that Infoport moment. I just want to point out that, uh, that uh, you're familiar, I'm sure, with it, that uh, 
our base SAS program ends up being our extract uh, mm -hmm. part of the ETL process, and it uh, brings it into the, the staging tables, as any, anywhere else should have some staging tables. And then that, uh, the views that, uh, that, that we built in, in there in Oracle create the presentation layer that's then transferred to, or to VA. So we control through those views what that what's seen there, and those views could stay stagnant have a different source form at any given time. We like it that way. We don't have to rewrite everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, in summer 2017, the Center for Faculty Excellence and the uh, and the steering committee invited uh, several faculty members to investigate their classrooms and their instructional practices via the MCAD tool, and um, that was really their homework. Mm -hmm. The first round, they came back and said, hey, we've never had access to this kind of information. This is cool. However, this, this, this tool doesn't say everything about our students. Well, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but there's lots of things we don't know about you. I don't know your religion. I don't want to know. Um, we don't capture um, in, in a way that we could share, at least. We don't capture gender identity we don't, or uh, gender pre or sexual preference. I don't care. Um, capture uh, disabilities. There are lots of things that hide out. One of our, uh, our fine professors said, I get a student comes in my, class, my writing class, writes a paper, gets an F. The second paper gets a D minus. Third paper, a C, a D plus. Hmm. Final paper gets a C minus. That student has grown. Can't capture it here. The goal, holy grail of, uh, of institutional research for, for that is that we would love for the instructors who want to have this information actually put it where we can get to it. <laughs> LMS has accomplished that. We can't get to the LMS data right now, but they would accomplish that if they would use the LMSs uh, appropriately and they'd be able to do it. The question that came out of this, this whole presentation of, with the first pilot group was, so what? What do I do with this information? Hmm, that's a head scratcher. <laughs> we have a lot of people asking us in institutional research for information, and we kind of like to think to ourselves and ask them back, well, what are you doing with this so we can help you get a contextualized way that it's really meaningful. And sometimes it's just out of curiosity. Well, just want to know, well, look at our website, it's not there, you're out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to, uh, to phase two, uh, we took feedback, the feedback from the, from the um, pilot group, and mo almost, almost all of phase two, thankfully, was, was done by Center for Faculty Excellence and, uh, and uh, the, uh, Steering committee. Mm -hmm. It was all about process and implement, preparing for implementation and getting things set so that people can contextualize what it is they're trying to do and answer that question. So what? A so tremendous they, amount of data literacy um, effort on their part, putting out resources. You know, interpret. How do I interpret these tables? This is overwhelming. What can I do about it? A lot of a lot of time and resources they they developed uh, that data literacy content. Creating scenarios. Uh, if I did this, where would I look in here to? To, to answer, did it make a difference? If I saw this in my classroom, how would I know if it was a pattern or if it was just a, a case, an incident? And uh, so it was really exciting stuff that they were doing there. At about the same time, I got a question from an instructor uh, from our honors program uh, about the diversity representation in, in his particular classroom in that particular uh, semester. He wanted to know if it was representative of, of the honors program at all, and he's going to dump, dump his uh, participation in the honors program because. It was a little less representative than he liked, and so we dug into it and found that, uh, that in fact he, he was his classroom was an anomaly, and the honors program was considerably more diverse than the, the population as a whole. Which we told him, I said, he was just thrilled to find that out. He would have known from the pattern here, be able to say, look at the pattern and say, yeah, I see that this is some kind of anomaly. I don't know why it happened, but it happened. So during this time, we also addressed some technical cons concepts. Uh, the most important one is provisioning. Institutional research is not in the business of provisioning. <laughs> we can't be. We don't have the resources to do it. And so we worked uh, with the Center for Faculty Excellence and uh, DWBI Data Warehousing Business Intelligence Group, uh, Rachel Sperano, to come up with a solution that, that uh, was effective for, for provisioning. And that solution involved uh, the Center for Faculty Excellence built in Sakai. An online orientation. Anybody who wants to use this, this tool has to look through this online orientation. Once they complete the orientation, they pick up a code that, that, that takes them, they pick up a link that takes them to, uh, to uh, InfoPort, and they have a code that they have to enter that tells that they actually finished the, the orientation. Once they've done that, 
their provision in Ipple. And then the tab is visible to them. And the in tab Ipple. is visible to them. Now, very much like the other solution we're talking about in a minute, this required us to, to grant privileges to the actual object, reporting object, to everybody who could ever possibly be using it up front, and then hide the object in Infoport. So the one place you can get to is through Infoport, you never see the direct link to it, ever. So even if you're provision for it, you haven't cleared this, you can't get to it. Now somebody could possibly share it, <laughs> the link, <laughs> and all bets are off. But it was, it was the best possible uh, scenario we had for this, and, and it seemed to be effective. So, uh, oopsie, back, 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 back. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So then it, uh, the, the DWBI team created an Infoport tab just for this. And then that tab is tied to that link to that, that uh, security. So there's a traditional model of role-level security that's occur been occurring here for some time in, um, in uh, VA, and we're seeing some of our Tableau uh, partners as well, that involves Protecting the data or putting the role of security on the on the developer side on the data side. Now, if you can develop and implement and, and um, visual analytics for Tableau, it's likely that you can see every bit of data that somebody's already got on there through another source. Anyway. So, putting the security on that side didn't make a lot of sense to us. And then when we look at the model that people are using, they're concatenating um, the onions and putting them in. A, and each cell has the concatenated list of onions that can, can see it. So the, the server has to parse those onions to find out, is it the onions logged in? We said, well, that seems a little bit of a waste of resources, especially if you've got a huge data. And so we, uh, we uh, chose a different approach. We put the real level security on the front side. We said, we don't care if the developers can see it. We only care if what the users can see. And uh, so to create this real level security model, um, we, uh, actually loaded a, uh, the Active Directory table, and we have it coming in every day now, into, into our model. And just two fields, ample ID and, uh, and onion. We put a, put a database side filter on that table so that the, uh, the onion that's logged in is the only row that will show up on that table. So we can't test that table to see if, if, if you're on that table because we'll only see our onion. <laughs> uh, that sucks uh, in test because we don't want to last refresh the test one. It is what it is. So the person logs in, they're validating its active directory, their onion is captured, it takes filters on that table. Now, in the case of the, of the MCAD dashboard, every row of data has the instructor's PID on it. So now we've got a PID, we filter on that table on that PID, and that's all they see. It's fast, it's easy. And it's no maintenance. <laughs> and it's no maintenance. Yeah. It's no maintenance. We love it. We're having a, we like to evangelize a little bit because uh, it, it makes a lot more sense to us than the other way. But uh, turns out it worked with, with other models where it's not a one to one relationship. You have to have the interview with the table. So if, if we were dealing with departments, uh, then you would have head to department and then departments uh, filter on everything else. Mm -hmm. We'll see how this works in just a minute. So in phase three of this, this spring, we invited whole departments to participate. They had to go through the orientation if they wanted to participate. Um, and orientation focus on inclusive teaching that uh, Greg talked about. And then instead of MCAT as, as, as a, a curiosity, it's a tool to support your, your instruction. Got a lot of feedback. Same thing as always, hey, <laughs> this is great. We have, finally have data in our hands. One more, what about these low enrollment sections? We can't see this. Well, if you think about, about making decisions, you don't make decisions on tiny sample sizes because they're very anecdotal. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of, of having it over time is you may not be able to see a single classroom, but you can see the trend and say, I only have sections of 10 for the last five years. I taught every semester. You've got enough data to look at, the, at that trend and say, this is what my students look like. This is how the grades are distributed over that time. You won't be able to look at, 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 at the points in time as much as you would like because you've got smaller numbers, but it's enough to see at least the big picture. And that's the best we can do right now. We don't have a, a, a a great answer to that question. But we get asked that question a lot. Over the summer, we added some, uh, some features to the, the database, uh, some more uh, demographics. Turns out that the last year was the first year that, uh, that uh, our students, incoming students, came with more ACT scores than SAT scores. Why? Because the state pays for it. <laughs> Every high school student can take ACT for free. 
um, added some things about age and, uh, and uh, the, uh, specifically separated out the, the underrepresented minority groups that as a separate flag. As a separate flag. And then the state, as part of the strategic plan, the, uh, the North Carolina County Care of uh, Urban, Rural, and and out of state, yeah, out of state's not, it's urban or, or rural, okay. based on the county so tier. We just the two, yeah. uh -huh. So we put them into those, uh, and it's important, the strategic plan has us wanting, has us needing to graduate more people from rural counties. Then we learned a lot of lessons between when we started in SAS, uh, the A74, we actually migrated from 6A to 74, we did some work in 6A, and then we did 74, he came in 74. Uh, learned a lot about how to make things work better, look better. So, hey, we're doing all this work anyway, let's just address that. Now, I wish we had a before and after picture. Uh, we don't. <laughs> so you're just gonna see the after picture, but um, we added some, uh, change the color scheme a bit, aligned it, uh, the front page that you saw when you got here and we'll see it again, aligned it with the Thrive there, Carolina colors, kind of branded with that. Changed the layout a little bit, uh, added, uh, modified how the filters showed up, and then added some information about what the metadata. Mm -hmm. What are you looking at? Because, well, QRM, what is that? <laughs> right. <laughs> we went live this fall, uh, extended the uh, invitation to all faculty, all departments. The um, black, again, this part is mostly administrative, the CFE and, uh, and, uh, and the student success um, folks are out there. They, they just went for the non email promotions. People get so many emails that they don't look at it. So they actually printed some stuff out, four cards put them there. They're visiting um, various department um, uh, meetings and uh, just really trying to, to get people to, to look at this. They're also looking for to have additional enhancements and looking for a different way to provision. There's some, some flaws with the provisioning method we've got going right now, which would bother me more if it was our problem. But now it's between <laughs> IT and Center of Faculty Excellence. Um, you're welcome to talk to them about those problems that you're interested in. And then there are some natural stories that come, come out of this that, that, we, that we, we started exploring this uh, last December during phase two. The registrar came to us and said, we've got this great distribution report we print out for a couple of people every semester for a couple of administrators, curriculum reasons. So what can you do about that? The, this great distribution has all the data in there. Well, one of the one of the promises that we were made to the, was made to the uh, faculty was that the grade distribution dashboard would not be used in their evaluation. Hmm. There's a type of go up. We're already giving this information out, uh, the registrar has already given this information out to the, uh, to the administrators. Anyway. So uh, we, uh, we explored uh, and uh, implemented a uh, pre-pilot um, project on the grade distribution dashboard curriculum and the grade distribution dashboard which is even much cooler than this one, I think. But uh, it's pretty, pretty pilot and we won't go look at it. So here we have the, uh, the opening page of, uh, as Greg clicks on to get us going on, my course analytics dashboard. Now, if you've ever used VA, you'll appreciate a couple of things about it. It did have a link under it, you know that question? Mm -mm. I don't think so. From, from, the, uh, from the view board. Do you went back to the presentation about it. Uh, one is that it, you, you have to log in. But one of the beauties of it is that anybody on campus can log in, and if you provision them to the dashboard, they can use it without additional. Um, I can just skip it and go on. But um, without an additional license, whereas with Tableau or, or, or Power BI, which are two tools we're working on now, there's some licensing in there for various parts. This is going to take me to, I need to go to Assess T to see the better look. Okay. It'll just take me a second. Yes, any kind of Is it possible for like administration now to pull reports for the whole department or for the faculty member over time? Again, because the, the, uh, the restrictions on this dashboard are that you can see only classes you taught. So we can't even see classes you taught through this dashboard. Is the point of the department not being able to see it because they don't want it subjected to the Right. Uh, so that's the uh, the, the time of nightmare we're, we're walking right now with the other dashboard, the great distribution dashboard, the curriculum level dashboard. So 
we can look at uh, the grade distribution by uh, limited demographics from, from the college school level, the division level, the department level, the class uh, prefix level, the actual class level one or the end, to the section level. And uh, so if administrators say Dr. Panther wanted to, uh, to, to find out what class you taught, she knew that you taught English 1301 or English 301 section 002, she would have really it there. Yes. What is the name of the other dashboard? It's a great distribution dashboard. It's in three I want to read it. Show me that. It's got no real name yet. He's Sorry. Pilot, yeah. right. And uh, so it's really, it's a way you look at that over time and also across those, say, uh, to the section level is, is are these sections being taught, are being graded equivalent? Is our pattern of money being graded? Are we, um, there we go. Thank you. Are we, uh, what's the word for, uh, Inflating grades. Uh, one, of, one, of our, one of our schools is very concerned about grade inflation. Are we being too hard on students? The physics department wants to know is our bell really looking like a bell? <laughs> okay, not grades here. When do you expect the grade distribution to happen? Well, we've got to get the three two together and uh, then we've got to uh, get through that process of the kind of division and uh, the final one. I think calendar year next next calendar year would be reasonable. Your uh, the person in charge of security thing right now is uh, senior associate uh, registrar um, Christy Sanford. So push on her and say, "Hey, I want to get this going," and, and see what happens. Please push hard. <laughs> we're, we're actually truly anxious for that one to get out because uh, we get a lot of questions about it. People really. So we're in SAS Visual Analytics now. Um, <clears throat> I'm coming in directly through it because I have not gone as an instructor through the provisioning process and I don't teach classes. So I just went in directly and um, through the back end. So an actual user would be seeing this through a, a frame and info port, um, but I've accessed it directly. And what we've done for individuals such as myself and Rob um, in our process that populates the data into SAS laser server um, for myself and Rob and a couple other individuals. Um, the view randomly selects 50 class sections um, and populates it as if we were the instructor of those 50 random sections so that we can demonstrate the dashboard. So um, this, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna see data in here, um, but it's completely random sections um, and all the course names and uh, numbers and section numbers have all been masked to just show test. So the real sections are real students, but we don't know which section. But it's all students. mixed up, yeah. <laughs> um, so when you come in, we've designed a landing page, um, and again, throughout, um, it's the color scheme is based on the Thrive logo, so that's um, what dictated sort of the look and feel. And these resources we put there um, based on feedback from the Center for Faculty Excellence to direct individuals to resources for inclusive teaching and, and other information. So when you come in, um, this is the table that Rob was discussing when we were talking about the row level security. So this is actually the Active Directory table. We've got that a global filter on that so that the only row I can see on that table is, is against my onion. Um, so here I can select that PID and this is what filters then all the rest of the data throughout the dashboard. So now I can only see sections that are assigned to Greg Harris as the instructor. So what you need to do quick is take a picture of the screen because that's his real name, that's his real pit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'll quickly... Uh, let's uh, talk about this one more, one second longer. SAS assures, I've already clicked it, sorry. Yeah, SAS assures us that we should not have to take this step. And when we go to BIA, they assure us it's absolutely not gonna happen, but this can happen in the background, the filter. Right now, even though there's only one row there, even though it's a required field, we can't make it go to that field and skip the step. Yeah, you right. have to select. Yeah, right now the user so still has to touch it. So I'll talk a little bit first about um, navigation of the report. What we've done is on every tab, the report filters on the left are consistent. Um, <clears throat> and you, we've got this through in a scrolling area. Um, so everything from admit type, residency, their PAL status, first gen status, age, gender, etc., and then of the actual class sections themselves, 
all the information that's displayed can be filtered based on any of those combinations of filters that the instructor wants to see. So that's very powerful detailed information right at the beginning. Um, so what we start with is um, the overall. So this is these are all of the 50 test <laughs> sections that um, I have been assigned to at random. Um, you can view the overall distribution of all of the history of what I've taught. So let's say as an instructor, I'd, I'm just curious about um, my class, my course, test 100. I can see all of the distribution rather of the of the courses that I've taught that are course test 100. Um, yeah, and you can, as you look at that, uh, look at the bottom graph here. His overall uh, overall teaching is more more diverse than that particular than, class. than that random <laughs> sections that we've grouped together as test one hundred. Um, and so, if you're familiar already with SAS Visual Analytics, um, not much of this should be a surprise to you. You can hover over all the objects to get. Um, descriptions of what you're looking at. So we're looking at in this random sample 309 individuals I've taught in course test 100 um, were female for all for all of time. Let's say if I just want to look at fall of 17, um, then I just have you know 67 percent of uh, the students that I taught in that particular course that term identified as female, and we have all the other um, demographic. Um, areas here displayed as well um, and we also show some cross tabulated information um, for race and ethnicity so right here I've got I'm just looking at one um, section but again faculty having access to this information is is pretty novel um, at Carolina so there's been some excitement um, from individuals um, who can see this and this is taking a slightly different view of the student demographic information. Again, all of our filters on the, the side are the same as what we saw on the previous tab. Um, we've got some data definitions right up front. We're forcing, <laughs> forcing this upon people. Um, we can't make them read it, but um, we're trying to do everything that we can to make sure that people are speaking the same language and understand what it is that they're looking at. <clears throat> but I'll tab through some of the demographic distributions. So here it takes a slightly different look. Um, so here we've defined um, traditional students as those 24 years of age is, or younger, and non-traditional as um, 25 years of age or older. Again, this is only undergraduate classes that we're looking at in this dashboard. Um, and you can see the distribution uh, percentage-wise um, of grades among those populations. <clears throat> And um, the rest of the categories um, are the the rest of the um, categories function the same way. Um, you can just view it um, slightly differently. There's something right. to note here with the visual analytics and behavior, and it may be true of all visual visualization tools, but it's particularly true of SAS. Go back to the race, please, and just start filtering down. This list is in this order. Only I'll be lost one already. Yeah. If you're not paying attention, you'll lose the lose categories. And so comparing becomes a little bit trickier because the things just disappear. The other thing is if we're looking at percents here, uh, if you're looking at a particular class, you could have 100% of the people getting an A or an F and find that you have only one student. Right. right. And so, and when you're looking at this, what do you, don't you need something to compare it to to know if it's normal or if it's out of whack? Well, in this case, the, the comparison is across the, the race ethnicity. They should, uh, if they had all things equal, if you had a really inclusive classroom and everybody is coming in with, with equal uh, uh, background and you've done the, the inclusive teaching practices, then you should see a generally equivalent <laughs> distribution of, of grades. And we'll get to in a minute too. Um, there's also some longitudinal views of this that I think would help inform the question that you're, that you're asking. Right now we're looking at everything all together. We've got some other views of it that would, that would I think, help with okay, that. because it seems like the actual makeup of the student body is really mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and for those like large university statistics, we have those available on our website publicly. So you can, if you want to know like what's the university undergraduate distribution of race, ethnicity, or those kinds of questions, we've got that on our, on our, on our website that's open to the public to get that information. Yeah, this great distribution of, uh, uh, this tab here is actually the intersection of, of grades and demographics, and its purpose is for you to explore your, your teaching practice and say, is there something I'm doing could do better? Something I'd be more inclusive, some, some way I could, could reach out to this population and, and, and help them to, to improve. Uh, is there some kind of a, um, of a disparity in this grade distribution? If all of my white students are getting A's and none of my other students are getting A's. Maybe there's a problem, vice versa. 
And well, uh, that and would be really obvious, but when you have a class of like 24 students and there are only two Hispanics, mm -hmm. if they're all getting how S, do you that? if they're all getting S, then maybe there's something you can do to reach out to the mm -hmm. students. Get well, and that information is made available to you here. So, I mean, you can see that this is consists of 24 students. Yeah. Um, so, if it was that one or two, you'd be able to get that information. Here. You can see that. Here. It is one of the limitations that it's the only way you can compare across to see if you're being um, uh, equitable is to see it in the first yeah. So, there, there's a different view that you can see it in the actual lens. Yeah. And that's down, down the line. Yeah. Um, so, the next tab. Um, is looking at some metrics as opposed to just straight distributions again your port filters on the left are all the same um, but what this is doing is looking at some aggregations over time so on the top we have trends in um, ABC and DFW rates um, so looking at passing and non-passing grades by percentage um, we've got that so in the red we've got um, the percent of grades that were either of D of F or withdraw there um, just as a, as a measure of another measure of success in sections um, and then we've got the ends and percents breakdown in a cross tab behind that. Those are the curricular questions. Uh, as you're looking at this and saying, I my grades practices uh, as a whole, are my classes doing better than they were before? Right. And it's just mm -hmm. a glance you can say, yeah, well, I've got fewer people dropping out or, or failing. Um, and then down below, um, we have a um, Another metric, which is looking at what we're calling class enrollment grade points, which is um, calculating the GPA of the section as opposed to calculating the GPA for a student. So we take all the attempted um, hours and all of the um, quality points and do the division to get the GPA as the section, um, as just another measure of how well did this section do. Here you see again, it's a pattern of that GPA section changing. Mm -hmm. and I'm not, am I inflating my grades unintentionally? Uh, did I make a change in curriculum and there's a sudden a jump or a drop? And you're able to see that with plans. Yeah. And what we've also done here, based on feedback from faculty, is we've given some description of how are these measures calculated, what am I actually looking at right on the object, so we've got that information there. Uh, and then finally, um, custom report one and two are the exact same. Um, they've um, asked us to have two tabs that are set up the same way so that they can do comparisons and flip back and forth. If I want to look at one chart filtered by XYZ attributes and the same chart filtered by ABC, I can flip between these two views to do a comparison side by side. So here's where some of the more longitudinal look at the data comes in. Um, so you can look at the percentages of, again, we're looking at grades here, but then you can filter by all of these attributes. So if you want to look at, you know, what's happening with, I don't know, uh, females across time um, as opposed to males, you can do this and look at the longitudinal information. So this is looking at, at it by term. You can also do the same, the same thing by looking at the grade distribution uh, chart as well. Um, and then finally, if my mouse will work, um, we have the full cross tab um, and you can filter again on all of those different student attributes, look at um, the, the grade distribution by class section that way. Um, so this detailed report is the place where you're gonna get all of that information that you're talking about. You can see the, the, the sample sizes very, very closely and, mm -hmm. um, and recognize the percents aren't, aren't always, or sometimes masking uh, that. Right. And then finally, as Rob said, we have another yet another um, opportunity to put definitions in front of people, um, full definitions and some other um, clarification um, statements about, you know, what are these county tiers? What does urban rural mean? Um, how are race and ethnicity reported out to the government? That kind of thing. Um, so does you have any, do you have anything else to add? To? So this has been an exciting project for us uh, to, uh, to be able to partner with these people. And, uh, do you notice that the process was not, a, not, not one, we didn't work held up by perfect. Get good enough, get something that works good enough out there, get people to touch it, feel it, play with it, and give you feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tough sell here. Because there's some political <clears throat> motivation for wanting things to be perfect for tribe, you don't want somebody to think that you're incompetent. There's no such thing in, uh, in, in dashboard development as getting it perfect for tribe. So find where you're comfortable. Feel like we met. So when you look at, look at these first couple of tasks, our task was to make sure we had the rollout security so that you only see what, you, what you're taught. <laughs> it was covered in our first iteration. 
to make sure that we were covering a specific set of demographics by themselves, we did. Make sure we were able to show the grade distribution by itself, we did. To make sure that we showed the, the, uh, the demographic, or the, the, the intersections where they met. We met that. At that point, we're ready to say, now, how does it look and feel to you? Are you able to use this? Is it going to be meaningful for you? And then the, people, the sponsor says, okay, we've got this. Now, how do we contextualize it for our, for our constituents so that they can use this in the way that we designed it, desired it for being used? So it, it's been a fun uh, project for us and, and has given us a, um, a good um, game plan for similar projects. So you asked, I think we got a moment. If you want to pull up the other one, no, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think that, yeah, not so much. No, not so much today. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think we should. Yeah, I don't, think, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. Don't say I just do that. Yeah. So, um, uh, difficulties we're having um, as with, with any tool. On one hand, we want to use the tools because we don't we really, we aren't um, funded well enough to have um, professional web developers designing. Java and, and PHP and, and all these applications to do it. And when that person is out sick, uh, off wins the lottery, run over by a bus, changes jobs, we're left with no support. So we really want to get into where we're able to deliver um, information this way. Oh, another provision that, that came out of this, and before I start going to come back to that, but is that you're not supposed to be able to download or print this from the screen. Mm -hmm. So that the internal download and print functions are supposed to be turned off. They are. Uh, anyway, back to the other one. <laughs> so uh, one of the difficulties is that this does require partnership. So the SaaS servers have to be up and running. The data have to, we have to make sure the data are loaded in there. And uh, sometimes there are glitches. Sometimes we're notified, sometimes we're not. And sometimes there are opportune glitches, right? When the provost is looking at a dashboard. And then where's the blank ball? Well, it's our fault. <laughs> So uh, there, there are some things about that, but overall, um, we're finding that that uh, this is a very efficient way to do it. The, the biggest problem, again, we find <laughs> our leadership reaching for shiny objects all the time. The solution is not the tool. Any tool we have, the three that I just talked about, can produce something similar to this. The solution is getting our data, figuring out how to get our data structured in a way where we can actually report it, and making it sustainable. There's that. There's Rob's soapbox for today. Making it sustainable because. A lot of these tools uh, show you how you can do these ad hoc reports. Well, that's lovely. As an individual, if I need to look at data a certain way and, and see it, that's lovely. As an enterprise, if we need to produce, or an organization, if we need to produce reports and keep them maintained, that's not sustainable. You have that model. And so the process that the great went through on this technical <laughs> side, extracting stage of the data, have a process to do that, set up those uh, the, the presentation layer, and then whatever tool you want to report off of, it's ready for. And that's that's a very sustainable model. Anything else? Yeah. So, do you all have questions for us about the about when the process? Did you say the grade distribution dashboard is going to be in final form. <laughs> when the uh, when Christy Samper, Treasurer's Office, has got the steering committee to forward it past pre pilot. Past what? That's pre pilot right now. Uh, a few people that like the days one year, we had a few people who invited to test it out. This dashboard, a few people were invited to test it out. Can we need an email from like, oh, as much as you want? As much as you want. <laughs> you have my permission. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you CC Laura DeBrazi on the register on that too. <laughs> I mean, honestly, uh, to get information in, in, in people's hands, it's the loudest the person crying the loudest. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, as long as they're, they're hearing the cries, it puts a sense of urgency on what's otherwise been uh, not so urgent. I see a dying question in your eyes. <laughs> well, it's more for a thing. <laughs> well, I knew it was dying. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you for coming. Any Thank you. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. We should do it again sometime. Yeah.